Okay, so uh, thanks for coming and then during uh, the series of lectures till the end. Uh, uh, so this is part four of, uh, of uh, introduction to parameterized uh, algorithm. And I thought that at the end, we can actually uh, delve a little bit more into uh, the area of parameterized algorithm that is really close to whatever is happening here in Bonn in this trimester. Uh, namely, uh, parameterized complexity of integer linear programs. Because uh, during the last uh, five or ten years or so, there was a really exciting progress in getting um, interesting uh, algorithms for integer linear programming using various parameters and uh, uh, various new techniques. And I would like to uh, give you some uh, introduction to that and also to uh, stuff that is classic in this sense. Yeah. So integer linear programming, uh, I hope that you know what is this. Uh, what, what is this? Uh, so we will be working with different uh, uh, linear programs. Uh, the most basic formulation that you can, uh, that you can write is simply, uh, you've got some vector of variables X and you've got some matrix A and you've got constraints looking like that. Yeah, so you write that, uh, that uh, if you apply this matrix, this vector of variables, you get some vector and it is uh, pointwise smaller than, than this. So this corresponds to linear constraints looking like that. Maybe a uh, one one, a one n, x n smaller or equal than b one, a uh, two one, x one plus and so on, a two n x n smaller or equal than b n and so on and so on, a m one x one plus and so on, a m n x n smaller. Right, so this is uh, written in the matrix form. This is written uh, to actually see what's going on. Yeah. So, and usually in linear programming, you want the variables to be taken from simply, uh, so from simply uh, the field of real numbers. So this is continuous optimization. While in combinatorial optimization or integer optimization, we want to uh, actually optimize over or uh, um, solve linear programs over uh, integers. Yeah, so I want in, uh, the variables to be, to be integers. So this is a linear program and about this linear program you can ask uh, a few questions. The most basic question, this is a question that we will be focusing on is uh, ILP feasibility. Namely simply you want to ask is there yeah, evaluation of the variables x that satisfies the constraint. Yeah, so a x is smaller than b. And in here, in ILP feasibility, you want this x to be to be integral. Yeah. So of course, this problem is NP-hard. Uh, you can, uh, for instance, vertex cover that we had in the in the first day, uh, we uh, cast as uh, an instance of ILP feasibility. Uh, where you write that the solution must be of size at most k addition. The second one is optimization. That's the usual. So you want to say minimize uh, over all the x's such that um, over all the x's such that uh, you the constraints are are uh, satisfied. You want to optimize some optimization goal. Usually you work with uh, linear optimization goals, so you have some. Uh, target vector C, and you want to optimize the uh, this dot product uh, between between your point and C, and this works like that. That if this uh, K is the polytope given by this linear program, then essentially you have direction C, yes, and you want to find the uh, the point of the polytope that optimizes uh, those directions. Yeah. So during this talk, uh, I will be mostly focusing on ILP feasibility because that's the easier to talk about. But most of the stuff, actually, probably all of the stuff I'm talking about, uh, can be also applied to optimization. Yeah. yeah and here you also have integral. Right, so uh, given this, um, we can uh, start now to think about, okay, I've got this ILP feasibility, what kind of parameters I can think about in, uh, in this? And uh, because the problem has so many different 
so you can think about different parameters and uh, try to understand the complexity in uh, in those parameters. So the natural that the, the, the natural one we will be thinking about is n, the number of variables. Yeah, so uh, FPT algorithm with parameters by n would be an algorithm for a low dimensional uh, linear program uh, working in, uh, in, in only few dimensions. M, the number of constraints. Yeah, so an FPT algorithm parameters by the number of constraints would be an, uh, a solver for instances where the number of variables must be very large, but the number of constraints is relatively small, yes? And uh, another uh, parameter is, say, delta. This is the maximum uh, value of a coefficient uh, that is in the constraint matrix. Yes, this will also come into play uh, in, in several uh, places. However, these are the most basic uh, parameters you can think about. There are many, many more. Uh, I will talk uh, about some at the very end of the talk. Uh, namely, you can look at this uh, matrix A and try to somehow quantify its structure. In a sense, if the uh, linear program is somehow well structured, you can probably exploit this to get a better solution. And this has been done, and this is where this uh, exciting new progress is happening. Good. Yes. I guess in one answer, you, uh, you can make the yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, of course, I assume that the matrix is integral. So, so the matrix uh, in this, we assume that this is integral. And let's say that the optimization goal is also integral. Yeah, so all, all of the stuff is integral. Uh, thanks. Right, so now that we have uh, uh, the parameters listed, we can uh, think about what kind of algorithm we can do for different parameters. So the first one that uh, we will be speaking about is the classic result from the 80s uh, about the parameterization by the number of variables which is usually called the Lenstras algorithm. Though I think the best running time of this algorithm to this date is due to, uh, uh, due to, I think, Kanan. And the uh, uh, running time of this algorithm uh, for solving ILP is uh, the best one is two to the order of n log n. Yes, or in other words, n power order of n times polynomial in the total encoding size of the instance. Yeah, so this is bit size of the instance. Yep. So this is uh, an FPT algorithm for uh, integer linear programming in sort of fixed dimension parameterized by the number of variables. Yeah? So this is a really powerful tool because it tells you that this kind of linear programs can be solved efficiently assuming that the number of variables is small. Yes? And we will see later on uh, an application of this to a concrete combinatorial, to the concrete combinatorial problem where uh, a concrete combinatorial problem will be uh, reduced to uh, solving an ILP with a bounded number of them. Good. Uh, so I don't. Uh, I will definitely not give a full proof of uh, of, of this result of Lenstra. However, I wanted to uh, sort of uh, give a proof sketch because I think it's uh, it's illuminating to understand what this algorithm really does. Because at the end of the day, it is just branching. Well, just branching. Uh, of course, you need to be very clever about this, and you you need to understand a lot about the convex geometry of those polytopes uh, that are associated with linear programs. Okay, so the proof sketch. And uh, I should say here that I'm definitely not an expert uh, in here and in convex geometry, so uh, um, there are people in this room who know much more about this, probably Daniel here, yes. Uh, so if there are any questions, you can, you can, you can uh, ask around as well. Uh, what I'm going to present you, I've learned from uh, wonderful notes uh, of Thomas Theodvos, uh, who wrote a very nice uh, lecture notes about uh, convex optimization, and it is beautifully explained there with details. Okay, so um, let K be this uh, polytope. So all the uh, points in the 
our uh, our linear program, and I will assume for simplicity it is bound, so it is a polytope. Yeah, if you want uh, to, to have full generality where this can be unbounded, you need to uh, work a little bit with technical details. So this is for now a polytope. Good. So what we are uh, now doing? Yeah. So let's draw a picture. So here is a um, n-dimensional space, and uh, here is the polytope somewhere. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> it should it should be convex, right? Yeah. I'm I'm not really that used to it. Yeah. Sorry. I I just usually I draw blobs in graphs, and I do not need to be convex, right? And uh, I got that in here. <laughs> okay. Here is the polytope K. Yeah. So imagine that uh, it happens that in one of the directions, in one of the uh, variables, this polytope is quite thin. What do I mean by thin? Say that this is a uh, direction, say, x1. And imagine that somebody told me that actually this whole polytope, k, fits uh, into all the points x for which the first coordinate is between some beta and alpha. So here is alpha, here is beta. So it fits into the strip, and this strip is pretty uh, is pretty uh, narrow, in the sense that beta minus alpha is bounded, let's say like that, by uh, these are integers. Uh, is bounded by some function of n. Yeah. So in terms of the of the of the of the dimension, it is actually narrow in one direction. Then I'm super happy because any integer point inside this polytope yeah, needs to have an integer point, uh, uh, the x1 variable uh, between alpha and beta. And I can branch what it should be. Yeah? So I can branch whether my integer point I'm looking for is here, or here, or here, or here, or here. There are f of n branches. Yeah? So if, if this happens, then I can branch into f of n options fixing x1, right? That would be great. However, of course, in general, you cannot uh, hope that uh, uh, there is a direction, one of the main directions of the, of the current basis, uh, where the polytope is filled, yes? For example, let's imagine the following situation, where the polytope looks like that. So it is uh, a sort of thin. It still misses all the integer points. For instance, the integer points are like that around this polytope. But still, in both of those directions from the picture, it is it is actually quite wide. Yeah. But still, looking at this picture, this polytope is still thin in some direction. It's just not the one of the main direction. Yes. You can see that if I now draw, uh, like, in this direction, yes, the width of the polytope. Is, is, is thin. So let's try to exploit it. Uh, what would I do in this situation? I would probably look at the, say, integer vector v pointing this direction. Suppose that this direction is being, is being defined by some integer vector v, yes? And uh, um, what I can think, thinness in this direction intuitively means that if I look at the whole polytope and I look at the uh, dot product with v, so the uh, uh, lines with with the same dot product with v are perpendicular to v. I should see only few lines crossing crossing k. Yeah. So in this way, I would branch on which of those lines uh, is my uh, should be my point I'm looking for. Yeah. So to make this intuition formal, yes. Suppose that k is inside a strip. So this strip will look like that, the alpha beta, inside the strip uh, of all the uh, points x, such that the scalar product with v is between alpha and beta. Yes, uh, for some integers alpha beta. Alpha. Uh, so those are integers. 
such that their difference is again small. Alpha minus beta is bound by some function of f. So observe that it is not really this, uh, this beta minus alpha is not really the width in terms of Euclidean distance. Yeah? The longer I have v, yes, the more I have here those, those lines. Yes, because the um, the larger is this uh, is it can be the scalar product. Yes, so scaling v actually uh, puts more lines here. So I not only want to have a direction in which this polytope is spin, I also need to have a direction that is defined by a vector that is pretty short. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. V. Yes, v, v needs to be an integer. Yes. So so this is what I just uh, said. So v needs to be an integer vector. Yeah, because you want that if this is an integral point and this is an integer vector, this scalar product will be an integer and it will be an integer between alpha and beta. Yes. So then what you, if you are able to find such a vector v, yes, then you can again branch, branch on, uh, uh, well, you are looking on, for a point, uh, for a point x. So you branch on what should be the result of v and x. Yeah. So for every gamma between alpha and beta, I branch into uh, an into a subinstance when I add this constraint to the to the program. Yeah. And I recurse and so on. Yeah. And if I have a bound f of n on the number of possibilities for this thing. Yes, then I branch into a bounded number of instances. And in each of those instances, I'm reducing the dimension by one, yeah? Because I'm restricting my attention to a subspace that is one smaller dimensional, yeah? I'm adding one more tight constraint, yeah? So the recursion depth will be at most n, yeah? So now the question is whether I really can hope for the polytope to be flat in, one, in at least one direction and also find this direction. And the answer is yes. So this is uh, called, I think, in, in convex geometry, uh, uh, Hinchens. I hope that the translation of Hinchens is written like that. Uh, in every OK, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, Hinchens flatness theorem. Here I will uh, put it in say algorithmic form. So given a polytope, given K, we can in time a polynomial in the um, in the in the program that defines K find either the first possible outcome is an integral point inside. in K, or the second is a direction where in which the polytope is flat. Yes, so uh, uh, a vector V, yes, a vector uh, uh, that is integral such that uh, K is in this strip and also alpha beta, such that K is exactly the, in the strip between alpha and beta, Yes, and beta minus alpha is bounded by, I think the proof uh, that is I've seen is two to the order of n square. Yeah. yeah, so then I would have branching with branching factor two to the n square every time I branch into this many instances, the depth is, uh, is n. So this will give me running time uh, two to the order of n cube, yeah, times normal in the size of the instance because this is what I pay in each node of the recursion tree. Great, so uh, this is Hinchin's flatness theorem. I will not prove it. This is uh, a result from, uh, from convex geometry. Let me uh, just quickly highlight uh, how you actually do it. Yes, so there's a lot of details uh, uh, that needs to be done here. So the sketch is like that. So first of all, you can assume that K is actually not just a arbitrary polytope, but K is an ellipsoid. 
Okay, it's an um, electrolyte. It's not a polytope or a convex body, but uh, this comes from. Uh, um, but uh, but this theorem is also uh, just true for convex bodies. Uh, so this comes from John's theorem because for every uh, convex body K, you can always find an ellipsoid, uh, say E, such that K is both has epsilon inside and is contained in n times epsilon. Yeah, so uh, n times uh, the ellipsoid. So E scaled by factor n. So the picture is like that, that here you've got your convex body uh, K and you can find an ellipsoid inside so that if you scale twice, you actually have the whole body. So this is an ellipsoid that sort of up to factor n sort of shows you the shape of the of your convex body. Yeah. So this means that if I just try to find a flat direction for the ellipsoid A, yes, I lose only factor n when trying to approximate a flat direction for the body K. Yeah. So by losing factor n, which will anyway be swallowed by this two to the n cube and n square, uh, I can just focus on this ellipsoid E, on this ellipsoid E, and I can also find it uh, efficiently as far as I know. Okay. So now what happens uh, if I have an uh, ellipsoid E? The idea is that first you uh, apply apply uh, affine transformation transformation so that this ellipsoid actually looks like a ball. It is say a ball at zero of radius one. Yeah, so you just uh, uh, transform the whole space so that uh, so that this ellipsoid now looks like a ball. Yeah. Well, so this means that the lattice of integral points is being transformed by the same transformation to some lattice lambda in the uh, now in the transformed space. Yeah. Yeah, the, either the lattice shift or the ball is shifted because this can be also not uh, not not in the middle. But this is some kind of maybe shifted lattice. So now the idea is that you look at this lattice lambda and you uh, try to understand this lattice. And what you do, you apply the LLL algorithm to get a reduced basis. So. I'm not definitely not an expert in LLL, but from what I understand, the LLL algorithm uh, looks at a uh, basis of a lattice and tries to find another basis, which is sort of as orthogonal as possible, greedy. And uh, what uh, the argument is, is that if I find a as orthogonal as possible uh, uh, um, basis of this lattice, then either all the uh, vectors of this basis are short, and then you can very easily find an integral point, or there is a long direction in this in this basis, which before the transformation corresponds to a direction in which the, um, the ellipsoid is, is flat. So this is like a win-win depending on how long are the vectors in the lattice. Good. So this uh, sort of ends the sketch of the proof, ends the sketch of the proof of Kinchin's flattened theorem, which gives you Lenz-Cross algorithm. I don't really know, uh, as far as I understand from the literature, there are better uh, variants of flatness theorem where this bound is uh, actually quite close to linear, like n to 4 over 3, I've seen somewhere. Um, yeah. Where there are problems with computability of this, I don't really know how Canon's uh, improvement works. Mm -hmm. Ah, I see. Okay, so you can uh, here be expo like FPT in the in the in the in the uh, what's it called uh, in the dimension, and here get a better factor. Yeah. Okay. And that would also give you the same amount of time. Mm -hmm. But Canon had to do something more complicated, uh, and he uh, proved his his results. He didn't have the best the best possible. Ah, here, I see. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean <laughs> people have done stuff and I also have to do it. Yeah. Yeah.
So yes, this is a thing having with the running time and with the proof. However, the important open problem is here, here is whether you can improve this dependence on n. Yeah, so whether you can get to this small of, of n log n, FPT algorithm uh, times polynomial in n, polynomial in. I guess many people tried. Uh, I tried also for like one week to try to prove a lower bound. And there are a, so like, because uh, I know the machinery for lower bound. So I just wanted to see what, what, what goes wrong. And there are definitely uh, obstacles for a lower bound. So yeah, I don't know how, what people believe in the community, whether it should be lower or not. I think it should be lower. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Mm, I don't really understand. So if you know that your whole body K is, is in this strip, this means that every integral point uh, inside that you, that you could, uh, and if, uh, uh, that you could find uh, has this, the dot product with V between alpha and beta. And between alpha and beta, there is only a bounded number of integer points, of, in, of, of, of integers. So you just guess what will be the scalar product of the point that you're looking for, branch into possibilities. Yes. Uh, so as far as I understand, there are variants of Finch's uh, flatness where this is actually polynomial in yeah. Sorry, yeah. So I, I mean, uh, no. I think there's so, low bound, so, yeah. That the whole recursion tree must yeah. be of size end to end. Yeah. Good. No. Good. I guess we can also take this uh, the further discussion offline. Uh, because now I wanted to, to give you an application of this in a uh, parameterized algorithm. And the problem I will be working with is also the string. So this will be a string problem. Uh, so what I'm, uh, okay, so I've got some alphabet uh, sigma, so this alphabet of letters, say, I don't know, A, B, C, and so on. Uh, and I've got a bunch of strings, yes? S1, S2, and so on, SK, and all of them are strings over sigma, yes, uh, of the same length. Length can be large, length is capital L. And the question, and also I've got some integer d. This my this is my distance parameter. Yeah. So uh, uh, the question I'm asking is: Is there one string? I want to find say, sort of a consensus between those strings. And by consensus, I want a string with the same uh, over the same alphabet with, uh, with with length l, such that the distance, the humming distance between each of those string and t is at most t. Yeah, so I want to find like a one center string that is at distance at most uh, at most t uh, at most d from each of the input ones. Yeah, so that's a that's a nice problem, and uh, you see here a lot of different parameters d, k, size of sigma. There is actually a very nice d power d branching algorithm. Now we will work with parameter. Uh, k, yeah? So I want to parameterize by the number of strings and give you an FPT algorithm for this parameter only. Yeah? Good, so what's the idea? So imagine that, uh, yeah, maybe I can uh, also give you some example uh, to get a better grasp of this. If I have strings A, B, A, 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 now A, B, B, C, A, B, C, D, A, D. Yeah, then what would be the consensus? It would be natural to have, say, put A here on this because like a majority is A, put B here because majority is B. Here, probably it would make sense to put B because here the two guys, uh, I would like, 
I am at coming, I'm adding, contributing the Hamming distance from this one only by one. Here probably A makes sense. Uh, and now observe that if I have put A here, yes, I would be at Hamming distance uh, free from this guy. Let me put B instead. Yes, yeah, so now I'm penalizing only the first two. So then I am at distance, I hope, two from this one because these two positions differ. I am at distance uh, two again from this one because these two, po two positions differ. And from this one, I am also at distance two because of the first two positions. Yeah, so from each of them, I am at distance two. And uh, observe that in here, I have cho chosen not the majority option. And in here, even though that this position looks exactly the same as this one, I actually took a different choice. Yeah, so there are some intricacies, intricacies here. But this, uh, this example already shows you sort of how this problem behaves because sort of every position, on every position you make an independent choice. Yeah, what you put in this position in the, in the, uh, in the target string. Uh, so we will just code making those decisions as an ILP uh, whose uh, number of uh, variables will be bounded by k only. Okay, so how I can view a situation on a position, yeah? Uh, so uh, here is a position, yeah? Here are those input strings, what, what they have on this position, call it position number i, yeah? So some of those uh, uh, strings have some letter, say, a. Some of those strings have some letter b, and maybe one has position c. So now it only makes sense to choose one of those positions, one, one of those k letters that appear on this position. It doesn't make sense to put there a letter that's complete that is penalizing everybody, yeah? But then I need to choose here A, B, or C, yes? And anyhow I choose it, yes? Uh, I will penalize all but one of the groups, yes? All, all strings, in, in, strings in all but one of the group will actually get plus one to the humming distance. Yeah, so this means that the position can be described by the type of this position, and the type is simply a partition of the of of the strings of one up to k into those groups, because this exactly describes the uh, the behavior of a position. Yes, know that this is independent of the of the size of the alphabet. Yeah. So the number of types yeah, is bounded by k power k. Yeah, so the tie is, a, imagine I've got a position, yes? And I am looking at what, uh, what letters are in the consecutive strings on this position, yeah? So here I've got a partition of those, uh, of those strings according to uh, which of them have on this position the same letter, yeah? So now the functionality uh, like what will happen on this position is I need to choose one of those groups and then all strings apart from the ones in this group will get plus one in the humming distance. And it doesn't matter whether it was A, B or C, and C here or D, E or F, yeah? It only matters what was the partition, yes? So only the type, the partition of numbers one, from one up to K into those groups, this, is, this describes completely the behavior of this position. Good. So now uh, for each position, I need to understand, yeah, I need to uh, choose which of the groups will not be penalized and which of the others will be penalized, right? There is only a bounded number of types, yeah, k power k. So let me write uh, variables, both for each type tau, call it tau, and Choice alpha. This is a choice for this uh, for this for this type tau. Uh, so uh, so this is one of the parts of this partition. Let me write a variable x tau alpha. This is the number of positions 
of type tau that that evaluate to alpha yeah so for instance in this example this would be two positions of the same type and one of them is evaluated to the first choice the second is evaluated to the second choice yeah so one of those variables would be one and the second would be one as well yeah so how many variables i have well bounded by k power k this is the number of types times k this is the number of, uh, of possible choices for k power k plus one right so now i need to write the constraints yes so what i need to write i need to write that uh first of all i need to write that for every type type tau if i sum over all the possible choices yes those variables I get the total number of occurrences of uh, tau. Yeah, so I just need to uh, phrase that uh, in total, the, the total number of times I evaluated uh, uh, tau to something, I got the total number of occurrences here. Yeah, so there will be two and one plus one is two. And second, I need to uh, make constraints that every, uh, every string is penalized at most d times, yes. Uh, maybe I will not write this uh, this constraint uh, formally, but every for every i from one up to k, the s i is penalized at most uh, d times. Yes, and this is uh, this is by summing those variables over the choices. The choice of alpha where alpha where choo choosing tau to alpha penalizes string number i yeah so this is a linear program that has many constraints because where we have one constraint for yeah well okay we have uh no no the number of constraints actually is still small yes the number of constraints is really still small however the number of uh the number of variables is k power k plus one yes now I can apply Lenstra. And solve in. Uh, yeah, this, there's a good comment here uh, about this number of constraints. Let me just finish this. Uh, so what would be the running time? It would be 2 to the uh, k power k plus 1 log k power k plus 1 order of times polynomial in the size of this thing yes which uh, boils down to power uh, let me write it like that two power uh two okay, plus two. yeah i'm just uh, confused that indeed the it seems that the number of constraints i wrote is small uh and that's actually good I'm sorry so this actually this called system uh, in inside it has uh, both k to k variables and roughly k power k uh constraints because for every type i've got the constraint yes and for every i i've got the constraint yeah so yeah, I could uh, apply now an ILP solver for uh, the a bounded number of uh, of variables. I could also uh, apply an ILP solver for a bounded number of constraints, which is something that we do now. Uh, so we now understood the parameters by the number of variables. We now can uh, move on to parameterization by the number of constraints. So let me say that this is just one example of uh, of this principle of writing your uh, program. Uh, in a bounded number of variables, there is a lot of applications also in scheduling um, of this for getting, uh, say, approximation schemes. There, these are called so called uh, configuration ILPs, where found a little bit adjusted, say, the weight or, uh, or the running time so that you've got a bounded number of different types, the jobs. And then the question is how many jobs of different types you schedule on each machine. And then you can write it in ILP like that. 
Yeah, so this this technique is called configuration uh, ILPs, and this is like a prime example also of uh, of uh, how a lens can be. Yes. Uh, do non-negativity constraints count? Uh, that's a very good question, indeed, because in here, ah, okay. Uh, Uh, so here I also have that uh, for each tau and alpha, I've got non-negativity. Uh, well, what do you mean by count? Uh, if I parameterize by the number of uh, uh, variables, this is my measure, yes? If I parameterize by the number of constraints, of course, I need to be super careful about whether I count them or not, yeah? So this is a very good uh, uh, point uh, that uh, when we are working with parameterized complexity of ILPs, we need to be actually careful about uh, the phrasing of the, uh, like the form of the program we work with. Usually we don't care about it because like, you can, for example, go from equation form to inequality form by introducing stack variables, but then you introduce variables, yes? And also some constraints to say that, for example, they are non-negative. Do you count those constraints towards your uh, parameter or not? This really uh, affects the complexity. And we will see uh, an instance of this in a moment. So, yeah. You're again jumping ahead. Uh, in, uh, uh, I think in 20 minutes, we will see the single exponential one. Yeah. Um, good. So this was a uh, uh, lens draw and it uh, closed the string. So now we move on to parameterization by the number of constraints. And here there was a very nice development a few years ago by Fritz Eisenbrand and uh, uh, Robert Weissman. Uh, there was an old algorithm of Dimitri from the 90s. I will not, not really talk about them because I wanted to talk about the, the more recent results that are super insightful in this whole theory. So first of all, observe that if I parameterize uh, my uh, ILP by just the number of constraints, and I do not assume anything more, then actually I run into a problem because I can encode subset sum as ILP feasibility with just one constraint. Yeah. If I have an instance of subset sum, then essentially I have variables x1, x2, x3, and so on up to xn. Uh, and it's now the number of variables. Uh, these are evaluated to 0, 1. Yes. And if I have on input numbers a1, a2, a3, and so on, dot, dot, a n, and target t, this is a formulation of subset sum uh, in, with an ILP with just one constraint. Yes? Assuming, of course, this comes for, for free. Yeah? So you need to be careful about the parameterization here, but uh, you see that something is fishy here. Uh, if you do not assume more, so usually what we assume in the context of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, the number of uh, constraints is that we assume that the parameters are both the number of constraints and delta, the maximum coefficient, yeah, which allows you to solve uh, this kind of ILP in polynomial time. Uh, good. Uh, so now the results that I want to speak about. So theorem number one is that if you've got a formulation like that, yeah, so equality form here and non-negativeness of constraints, yes, and you count only those constraints, so here it is M, yeah, so those constraints do not your number of constraints, yes, and this can be done Uh, pa, pa, pam. delta m power order of m times polynomial in the input size and the maximum coefficient of b. Well, this is the, this is the theorem of, uh, of Fries and Robert uh, proves actually you can 
uh, uh, later there was an improvement of this uh, B to log B. So you can uh, assume binary encoding of the target. Uh, now we actually also have strongly polynomial algorithm. Yeah that uh, do not care about this encoding at all, just measure the running time in the number of arithmetic operations. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure about whether this running time in this case is still preserved. So I would need to check it. So the theorem two, a more robust variant of this theorem is that if you have the same form, but you also have an upper bound on X. So know that here in this classic subset sum, yes, uh, I have an upper bound here. If I did not have, I just had non-negativity, I would have uh, like multiple, uh, I could take multiple copies of, uh, uh, of, of a vector. Uh, sorry? I don't know. Let let's think about it in the in the in the break. Uh, good. Uh, yeah. So you assume here that uh, that you have also upper bounds. And then this can be done. In again, that but now order of m square. Times poly. Yeah. So you see here that you pay, and here again, uh, uh, m is just the number of constraints in this matrix. These box constraints, so-called, do not count towards the, the number of constraints. Yeah. So observe that there is a gap that we have here between m and m square. For this, we know that it is ETH tight. ETH tight for delta equal to one, yeah, so for binary matrices. So you can prove that you cannot do better than two to the small, uh, you cannot do the small of m log m. But uh, we have a gap between m power m square and uh, uh, m power m b2 for this variant. Yeah, and this is a prime open problem. Yeah, I guess. Good. Uh, so I would like to sketch, or, or I actually give you the proof of this theorem because it's super nice uh, proof. Uh, I will later comment on how you use the same toolbox to prove this one. Yeah. Good. And the main tool for theorem one is Stein's lemma. So what is Stein's lemma? This is a very nice uh, 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 basic lemma in, in computerial geometry. So imagine that you've got the following situation. You've got, uh, a, say, uh, a space r power uh, r to the m uh, of vectors, uh, and you've got some norm on the space, yeah? And you've got a bunch of vectors, say v1, v2, vn. About all of them have small norm, so the norm of each vi is at most one, and moreover, they all sum up to zero. Yeah, so the picture is like that, that you start from zero and by adding consecutive VIs, you go around the plane somehow, yeah, you travel, but each of the consecutive steps that you do is short and you eventually reach zero again. Then the idea is that, uh, or then what Stein's lemma says is that you can reorder those ones in order to always during this walk stay around zero, yes? So then there is a permutation, say u1, so these are just these vectors permuted somehow, such that whenever you are looking at the partial sum from some i, say, to k of ui's, then the norm will be bounded always by the dimension, the dimension of the space. Yeah, so in other words, after the permutation, the situation like that, so this happens for every case. The situation looks like that, that you start from zero, 
and you always stay close to zero. Yeah, so maybe if you start with this vector, then maybe you can use this vector in order to get closer and so on and so on. So this is a super nice statement. Chinese proved it with some better, uh, with some worse constant uh, than M. Uh, I think M is tight as far as I remember the, the dimension. Uh, Uh -huh. You can do it better. Uh, no, no, like you don't. We expect there are norms where you can do much better, mm -hmm. but there is no norm at all for which you even can subtract one. Ah, okay. Uh, like we expect for L2, the answer is just a root M, but you, we don't even know M minus one. Yeah. So, yeah. Observe that this, this lemma with M holds for any norm. I find it actually pretty. Uh, pretty, uh, 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 pretty amazing that this can be proved for any any norm that you can that you can think of. Yeah. Uh, so the proof is very nice. I really recommend. Uh, there is a nice paper by Sebastianov uh, who outlines the proof. This is a really two-page paper, uh, very short. There is a nice LP argument inside. Uh, there is a caveat: it's in Russian, but it's beautifully written. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah, okay, so, so yes, there it is in English. <laughs> um, good, so this is the Steinitz lemma is the tool that we would be using, yeah, for proving a theorem one. So let's try to understand what really is, uh, uh, what really theorem uh, one uh, speaks about uh, in terms of subset sum, uh, just to understand what is this uh, LP saying, yeah? So this LP is saying the following. So imagine that a one, a two, and our columns, columns of A. Yeah. So then A times X. Yes. If X is a vector of variables, it's nothing else than column number one taken X one times plus column number two taken two X two times plus and so on. Column number N taken X N times, and this all should be equal to vector B. Yeah. So this is nothing else with. Uh, non-negativity constraints, then subset sum with multiplicities just on vectors, yeah? In, the, in, uh, in dimension one, this would be just subset sum with multiplicity, yeah? So the question is, I'm starting with zero. Yes, I want to end at some vector B. I can use the vectors A1, A2, An, each non-negative number of times, yes? And I want to ask whether I can travel from zero by adding those vectors somehow and eventually reach B. That's the question that is, that is written here. Yeah. Okay, so the idea is that now we can sort of use Steinitz lemma to try to re if there is a solution, to try to rearrange the solution to a solution that is somehow well structured. And therefore we can find it uh, quicker. Imagine that I do the following. That, well, uh, to apply Chinese lemma, I really need vectors that sum up to zero, yeah? So let n be super large. This is a, a very large integer. So that if I take the vector b and I divide it by n, that the infinity norm of that uh, is, uh, is smaller equal to, uh, let's say one. Actually, delta would be sufficient. Maybe I'll put here delta. It will be compliant with whatever I will do. So for example, taking n to be the L infinity norm of B would, would suffice for that, yeah? So then how can I reach zero on this picture there if I traveled somehow to get to B, I can just go back to zero by adding B over n many times, n times, 
might not be over n. Yeah, so let's take uh, a, a multiset M of vectors. Yes, so this multiset will contain X. Okay, so I assume that X is a solution, that I have some solution to this program, which means I have multiplicities with which I can take uh, the, the base vectors I want of A and so that uh, in the sum I've got I've got B. Yeah. So I will take x1 times vector a1, x2 times vector a2, and so on, xn times vector a n. Yeah. So in this way, I so far the sum of my multiset is, is exactly B. Yes. And also I will take vector minus b over n, n times, yeah? So in this way, I traveled there and back, which means that the sum, the total sum of multiset m is equal to zero, yeah? So now what I know, I know that all the AIs in their infinity norm, they are bounded by delta, yeah? Because, well, this was the a maximum coefficient in the input, and I also know by my choice that the infinity norm of this vector is at most delta. So by Steinitz and rescaling actually Steinitz by factor delta, I get that there exists, there is a permutation pi of this multiset M uh, where a partial sums Uh, are smaller or equal in the infinity norm uh, than uh, than what delta times yeah yeah than delta times the, the dimension and the dimension is m the number of constraints because this is the space where we work good so uh, uh, so this is the space where we work so now. Let pi prime, okay, so what is this permutation pi? It uses sometimes uh, those, those wide vectors, and then once in a while, it uses this vector in order to move a little bit back to zero, yeah? So let pi prime be pi with those vectors minus b over n removed. Yeah, so I just throw them out from the permutation. So now I've got like a, shorter sequence of vectors. So now my claim is that every prefix, the sum of every prefix of pi prime is uh, at distance uh, infinity at most delta times m uh, probably plus one, but whatever, from segment zero B. So what does it mean geometrically? This means that if I have here uh, zero and here I have B, then I claim that if I draw here like a sausage of width delta times M, so this is the sausage consisting of all the points that are at L infinity distance at most delta M from, from this segment. Then I claim that there is always a, so, then the, that there is a solution, there is a permutation that always travels within the sausage. Yeah, this will be this prefix. because this is a sequence of choices of, of my base vector, yeah? So I saw, well, this is, this is actually trivial because, well, what is the sum of prefix of pi prime? So some prefix of pi prime, this is the sum of the same prefix of pi, yes, plus, plus some number of times there is this vector minus bn. Yeah, so this means that the sum uh, in, in, in this prefix after, uh, after the removal is just this, which it norm is at most delta times M, yes? And this is just a point, well, it should be probably like that. And this is just a point 
somewhere here. Yeah. Okay, so we are, this is perfect because this means that there exists a choice, a sequence of, of, of moves, yes, that I am allowed to do. Yes, those, uh, those choosing those base vectors A1 up to AN that always fits within this, uh, within this sausage, yeah? So another claim, and I hope that I can leave it sort of about the proof is that the, if S are the points at distance at most delta M from this interval, from the segment from zero to B, so this blue sausage here, then the total number of those points is at most, well, this whole thing has L infinity norm B, yes? So we can peg here points at distance one from each other and there will be L infinity norm B of them, yes? And each of those, you can view this sausage as simply this rectangle, this, this square being moved like that. Yeah, so this will be bounded by the total number of those pegs I'm putting there times the volume of one ball and the volume of one ball is two delta M plus one power M, the number of points there. Yeah. So now the finishing line is that I draw a graph G. This is a graph, a directed graph, graph on the vertex set S. So I'm putting all the points in here as the vertices of my graph, yes? And the edges go from a set, from a point Z, yes? Uh, these are uh, integral points, of course. Yeah. Goes from Z to Z plus AI for every possible I, yeah? So whenever I'm at some point, Z here, I can use another vector from my base set to move to some other points. Yeah, so the out degree is equal to N. Yeah, so now what is the size of this graph? Well, the size of this graph is this times N. Yeah, I just constructed this graph. The only thing I need to do is to apply any reachability to get from here. To here. So this is a super nice argument. Uh, and uh, this kind of shiny lemma, uh, since, since this paper, this kind of shiny lemma arguments are all over the place in this theory. So in particular, let me say a few words about how you prove uh, theorem two. Uh, how you prove theorem two is that you solve an LP relaxation of this problem. And using this kind of Steinitz uh, argument, you prove that uh, you have proximity, that actually there, if there is an integral point, there must be an integral point that is in L1 norm close to, uh, to a solution to the fracture, to, the, to the, the relaxation. You need to have a vertex solution for this to hold, but, uh, but then this holds. So you find the vertex solution of the LP relaxation, you know that there should be an integral point that is close, and you can, you can find it using dynamic programming because the distance is bound. Yeah, so, and since then there is a lot of uh, additional uh, work in this, in this veins. Uh, so to uh, uh, answer a question that was asked here uh, about closest string, uh, I can now uh, give you very quickly how you can write closest string as an ILP with a small number of constraints, at least for binary alphabet. Uh, where can I put it? Or maybe here. So the alphabet is zero one. Yeah. So then for every for every uh, position for every i, I have x i. This is whether I put a zero or one there. And then I put constraints for index j. This is in one up. To j. Yes. I can write now that uh, the, the string number j is penalized at most d types. Yeah, so this is then over. And I put here xi or one minus xi, depending whether uh, on, uh, on the particular position there is zero or one in the string, and this sum must be at most d for every, for every j. Yeah, 
So this is now an ILP formulation of closed string on binary alphabet that has very many variables, but only K constraints. So now if I apply theorem two to this, I got uh, roughly K power K square. And this is the best I know for the closed string. Good. So uh, what I did not tell you about is uh, all this work about uh, uh, n-fold ILPs, uh, multi-stage stochastic ILPs. This is a work that sprung from here. Roughly, it was also developed simultaneously by uh, by, by, by a different group. But uh, uh, this kind of tools can be also used to uh, use structure of, uh, of the matrix in order to get, get uh, fast ILPs. Okay, I think uh, this is enough for today. So thanks a lot, uh, and thanks a lot for the whole uh, for being with me uh, uh, for the whole uh, uh, course. Yeah.